Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street is a modern campaign agency dedicated to using data-driven grassroots organising to build winning campaigns and make the world a better place. Whether you're in business, issue-based campaigns, or an organisation driving change in your local community, Dunn Street develops strategies to overcome challenges by connecting people that share the same values and organises them to achieve goals from the ground up. To find out how Dunn Street can partner with you and your organisation, hit us up at dunnstreet.com.au. Welcome to part two of our Kevin McKenna podcast. Uh, We recorded this all at the same time, but the podcast was so goddamn long, I decided to chop it up into two parts. Earlier in the week, we put up the part of the podcast where we talked about Scottish politics, uh, Scotland's move towards independence, um, Scottish culture, journalism, all that kind of stuff. Today's episode is, as I joked about it last week, is really basically for my immediate family and anyone who supports the Celtic Football Club. So we talk about sectarianism in Scotland and the culture and the the underbelly and the undercurrents that sectarianism uh, uh, forms in Scottish society. And then we spend most of the time talking about the Celtic Football Club. Um, Kevin has been a Scottish uh, sports writer for quite some time and it's just amazing getting a lot of his thoughts uh, on the club. Uh, both from a journalist perspective, but also from the fans' perspective at the same time. So I hope you enjoy today's uh, episode. Don't forget to uh, retweet this episode uh, or share it on all of your various different social media platforms and to make sure that you follow uh, Socially Democratic through our Dunn Street social media platforms on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn. So let's get to the second part of the episode with journalist Kevin McKenna. Okay, welcome back to the second part of the podcast uh, with Kevin Kenner. Um, let's uh, let's talk about sectarianism. We sort of touched on it a little bit earlier in the um, the, the part one of the episode, um, but I just sort of wanted to get your um, for, for you to give a bit of context for Australian listeners about. That this undercurrent of sectarianism that exists in Scottish culture, um, and give some context about the sort of the religious and cultural divides that exist, particularly in the west of Scotland, um, and then we can sort of move into how it's been a social problem for for Scotland for a long long time. Yeah. Um, so Scotland is uh, portrayed by uh, many. And, and by a lot of people within as having deep-rooted uh, issues with religious sectarianism, <clears throat> principally between Catholics and Protestants. That This is something that is it's a difficult concept for people who are Muslim or, or, or Hindu or Jewish to grasp because all they see is, um, is, is two factions of the, uh, the Ober... Uh, the universal Christian religion, who are divided by about two percent, <laughs> you know, by about four books in the Bible, and they can't cannot understand that. Mm. And when you boil it down to that, um, yeah, why is there? And I suppose it is because it's it's it's, it's political, it's cultural, it's become political, cultural, and social. It's not just religious, um, and. It was it start, started with the the Protestant Reformation, which was ha- was you know, one of one of the, the the countries where the the fledgling ideas of of the Reformation uh, came to fruition was Scotland, and for good reason, because the Catholic Church was corrupt, and the 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 the, the irony that tickles me is that if I had been around. In the 16th century in Scotland, I'd have been burning churches as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, and, and you know, and, until what? Until relatively recently, maybe a hundred years ago, any kind of vestiges of Catholicism were were treated with suspicion and persecution, and a lot of it was you could understand because. Uh, 
uh, such such were the the, the um, malpractice malfeasance um, of of the Catholic Church and priests and bishops up until the and including the 16th century 17th century that you know the new the new society didn't want anything to do with it. So when the Irish Irish Catholics began to flood into the country at the end of the 19th century, fleeing famine and persecution in their own country, there was, there was I suppose the, the field was set for potentially pretty serious civil disorder. Because um, not only were they bringing the old hated faith with them, but they were seen as an alien race. They were portrayed as being not just poor, but dirty, ignorant, um, criminal underclass, if you like. The fact that within four or five, that, that there's there's a there's two ways of looking at this. You can say, yeah, this sectarianism is still a blight in Scottish society, um, and uh, and and a curse in both our houses. Or you can look at it and say, well, actually. Given that all the all those conditions existed for serious civil disorder, the fact that within four or five generations hasn't happened in Scotland, and that the the downtrodden Catholic un, Irish Catholic underclass, which came here in rags, came to Scotland in rags less than you know 100, 120 years ago, that that now they are <clears throat> they have fully taken their place at the top of Scottish society. Um, they are well represented in, in politics, in business, in the media. So, if there has been, if there has been a lot of sectarianism and anti-Catholicism, it's not been very successful. Mm. So, you still see the manifestations of it, which are like orange walks, and there are still assaults. There, there are still, there are still people being nasty to each other, and saying bad things, and you know talking and saying bad things about the Pope, and King Billy, Fenians, Orangemen. No one ever died, or very, you know, no, we haven't had, actually it's wrong to say no one ever died. There have been, there have been casualties um, of this, but... Because it got pretty bad in the, the, the 90s, remember? I'm just trying to think of what was the yeah, genesis there was, of nil by mouth. Yeah, there, there was, yeah, there, there was... There, there was that. There was a, a poor lad who, who was, uh, who was killed, walking past a, a Rangers pub, um, or walking past a pub in Bridgeton, which was a, a, a part of Glasgow where a lot of Rangers fans are. <coughs> yeah. Um, but you can't, you know, you 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 can't portray entire supports, but that and. The other thing that makes me queasy is that so so Rangers are Rangers have got a a, a large well their their main the main kind of religious influence amongst their supporters is Protestant and with Celtic it's Irish Catholic and that's tribal but there are dozens of big city rivalries all over the world this one happens to be defined by um, faith and culture in Buenos Aires where you've got Boca Juniors and River Plate, it's based on its class in other areas it's race um, the manifestations of these big rivalries are usually quite nasty they look nasty um, to people who, who, who are not part of them mm. because football fans they tend to be working class, no nonsense, and uh, they they want to humiliate their rivals because that's that's what football rivalries mm. all about. The vast vast majority of people park park those rivalries um, w within a few hours of a game finishing. But in Scotland, there's a tendency to punish ourselves to say that this is this is. Um, this is terrible in the 21st century that we still have this. But there's, a, there's something, there's a more sinister aspect to this, and this is something I've thought about over uh, um, 
several years, that there's, in, in my opinion, there's a, again, there's a kind of liberal um, self-appointed elite in Scotland um, who, who hate all religion or, or hate Christianity and, they, and so they pretend to be upset by this tribal this tribalism and this sectarianism as they call it and so they jump on bandwagons as a means of getting rid of all manifestations of of religion or the, or the hated Christian faith from Scottish society. And I think a lot of that is driving like media coverage um, and the emphasis, overemphasis of um, sectarian violence. Um, what, what you do have is that you have, um, if you had to do a postcode analysis of, of the the areas where sectarian violence or sectarianism exists in Glasgow, you, you, would, you, would, you would find that a disproportionate amount of it is comes from the poorest areas. Now, I'm not saying that intolerance is confined solely to deprived areas, but these are the areas that it feeds on. Mm because there's deeper problems there. You know, there, there, is, there is poverty on a scale that most of the people in um, the chattering classes will never encounter, would never even recognise. And we're talking, in some parts of Glasgow, third world poverty. Well, we're talking about, um, in Glasgow, there, there, there being a seven-mile stretch where a, for a male, an adult male, loses... 25 years, 20 to 25 years of his life expectancy because of, um, you know, a deep-rooted pattern of, of inequalities. And it's too easy for the, the liberal elites to talk about sectarianism because it's, it's easy to identify. Everybody hates it. They kind of wring their hands and talk loftily about it virtue signalling, mm. isn't this terrible? And it's not nice, it's not terrible. What is terrible is the is the vast inequality and the gap between rich and poor and the disproportionate influence of the elites that still happen in Scotland. But those things take, you know, decades to solve. And politicians don't like... Um, they don't like areas that take decades to solve because they might not be around to claim the credit. If they to start something, if they really wanted to do something about this, they would have to institute something right now, which might take 25, 30 years, which means that they won't, they won't be there to claim the credit, and politicians like to claim the credit. Um, Tom Devine, who's an academic in Scotland, um, I remember during the... when Neil Lennon was in his first stint at Celtic, both as a player and then in management. Um, and that there, was a, you know, there was a whole bunch of things that had happened. It, it seems to be that every time Celtic and Rangers kick off in some way, then that's when the debate about sectarianism mm. S- mm. starts to really come to the fore in the media. And Tom Devine had sort of talked about... Uh, I think he might have even done some... Uh, had uh, undertaken some academic research yeah. and said that it wasn't actually... Sectarianism isn't... Okay, we can call it sectarianism, but he was arguing that actually it is a discrimination against the Irish Catholic diaspora living in predominantly the west of Scotland. Now, you did say at the top of this t- subject that, that the progression of those communities now are leaders in media, government, yep. business, sport, um, culture. Um, but he was saying, he made uh, the argument that there is still biases in Scottish culture towards that community. So it's not that both Protestant or Catholic communities in Scotland are suffering against each other, but there is still prejudice mainly directed at the minority Catholic community in Scotland. Is he a part of that sort of chattering class in some ways? No, no, Tom's actually... He's... He's actually conducted very, very recent research which says that, yeah, there, there, there has been... There has been discrimination against the, the Irish population in uh, 
Glasgow and Scotland. But that around about 2000, 2001, um, the, the um, incoming, the, the Irish uh, diaspora, the descendants of the Irish diaspora finally reached wages parity with the rest of Scotland. Um, and his most recent research has suggested that the um, anti-Catholicism is almost extinct. If you look at certain indicators in, in employment, in crime statistics, in health statistics, in economic purchasing power, the hard data suggests that discrimination is on at the point of extinction. Discrimination against Irish Catholics is at the point of extinction. And you can't argue against this hard data. No, not at all. Um, on the street, there are, there are parts of um, Glasgow which probably get a disproportionate number of orange marches, orange parades. And so they would tell a different story because they're, they're, seeing, they're seeing this kind of masculine, uh, vehement, um, uh, macho Protestantism, <laughs> preening Protestant, Protestantism during the marching season between what could be May to August, September. And if you live in those neighbourhoods, you could be forgiven for thinking, well, you know. Yeah, where's, the, where's your daughter? <laughs> and, and, I, and I get that. And there have been some bad incidents, including a priest being spat upon outside his own church. And this, the, there has been an issue about not stopping these parades because I don't think you can stop them. You can't, you know, you, you, can't, you can't stop people celebrating their traditions in the 21st century. Um, but there is an issue about re rerouting some of these marches. Mm -hmm. But the hard data would suggest that the, um, there is no, there, there's, not there is no, but we're, we're, we're reaching a point where the, 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 the traditional manifestations um, of anti-Catholicism are at, we're, we're at the point of extinction. But the other, ironically, I think there is a greater um, hostility towards the, not the Catholic Church, but Catholic or traditional Christian beliefs by the political classes um, who are stealthily, uh, you know, there's a renewed, there's, there's a renewed campaign to get rid of Catholic schools um, and to to, to get the Catholic Church, Catholic priests to officiate at same-sex uh, weddings, marriages. The Catholic Church would say that that's not discriminatory because um, uh, same-sex marriages don't give you any more human rights than civil partnerships, which is true. It's a matter of belief, and their belief doesn't um, impinge on the, the human rights, social rights of um, of anybody else, and I and I think the biggest danger to to Catholicism, ironically, comes from people in those parties, high up in those parties, who would be the first to to pretend to be outraged against discrimination mm. a generation ago or even now, mm. but it's a kind of subtle, it's a more subtle thing far easier to blame working class orangemen with their orange sashes and talking about kicking the Pope. Yeah. They're, they're the kind of convenient patsies for something that I think is a lot more sinister than that. Speaking of the Pope, let's talk about Celtic. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're, uh, for those of those who are still listening to this episode, and as I said before, it mostly is my family, um, uh, but those who are and unfamiliar with the Celtic Football Club, how would you best describe the Celtic Football Club? And I want to quote, and I think it was Graham Spears, and I remember reading this um, article at the airport on the way back from um, Seville, and I was flying from Seville 
in 2003 with my brother back to Glasgow, actually, to try and get tickets for the Kilmarnock game for the last game of the season. And we bought all the papers, the Scotsman, the Herald, the lot. We had it all. Even though we lost, we still bought all the papers, right? And I think he wrote and he said um, that it is undisputed now that Celtic is a sporting and cultural phenomenon, which I thought in some ways kind of felt, certainly at that time for me, summed up that club. How would you best describe the Celtic Football Club? Well, Celtic, Celtic now market this, the, the phrase, the, the mission statement that they are more than just a club. And, and they, they want that to mean that we are, that, that, that Celtic are, um, are moved by, by uh, values, deep-rooted values that go beyond mere football and, and making money because we were started to, to raise funds for the, the poor Irish immigrants that were pouring in in the late 19th century, and that we, that we care, we are on the, the side of the weak, that we are the, you know, we are the downtrodden, we are of the people, we stand up for the economically um, oppressed, if you like, and that these these are more important than just winning, um, or 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 of equal importance, and that that sets us aside from all these other um, clubs who are who are um, attached to capitalism, pure capitalism, and 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 certainly not those nasty Rangers people. Um, and yeah, m most fans, that's we we want that to be the case because. To us, Celtic is more than just a football club because uh, they were they were a light in the darkness for thousands of families who who were uh, encountering um, you know the, the entire the whole range the whole pattern of economic deprivation and discrimination in Glasgow and Celtic was founded and and they and every Saturday when they played they represented their aspirations, their hopes. Um, they they were e even though within ten years the kind of charitable angle had been replaced by the need to win, that was okay by the fans because what was the point if you weren't winning, you know, Celtic winning when they were being defeated in the workplace and, and in their neighbourhoods six days of the week, Celtic winning on, on the Saturday seemed to make it worthwhile and, and if you like, was a, a, a possibility of things to come, of better days to come. You know, the, the Irish knew, you know, lots of people in the Irish community um, we're beginning. We're, we're beginning the journey to to make lives better for themselves, and the, you know the, the Irish, like the Scots, are a very um, redoubtable, hardy race. Things wouldn't remain like that forever. No point in greeting about it. We'll, we'll just go on with it. So Celtic was their way out of the darkness, and that's been handed down through every generation. And it's never, curiously, it's never been watered down. Uh, you know, it's not really been diluted. I mean, I've, uh, my, my children are, um, are as fervent about Celtic as I was, as my dad was. Um, and it's because it carries those values that they all get told why Celtic was founded, um, and what it means. Distance as well. I mean, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I, I was born and raised in this country. Um, and I am I'm, I'm a first generation Australian but my nephews and nieces are second generation Australian and they are just as passionate and driven about this football team that is literally on the other side of the world and for some of them they've yet to lay their eyes on Celtic Park I mean I love it's very romantic because it's a lovely story not many clubs have got that um, have got that story at their foundation you know, quite literally being raised up to help the poorest in society. And although their roots in Irish Catholicism, very clearly at the outset, ditching any attempts mm. um, at being exclusively Catholic. And so that resonates, that th those, are, those are universal values which, which we see played out in uh, 
literature, in film, in, in art, which has driven all the uh, all, all all artistic output. So so they've been favoured with 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 a beautiful birth, if you like, mm. and and it's a, a, a story easily told and easily recognised. And you know you add into that the the iconic nature of the green and white hoops, which are instantly recognisable wherever they play. And then you've got the entire Irish songbook, which comes with it. And you've got the the later struggles um, in Northern Ireland uh, against the British state. So you've got republicanism, nationalism, Irish culture and identity, working class culture and identity, anti-elitism, um, making... Uh, partnerships with other left-wing and anti-capitalist movements and clubs throughout the world, as, as well as this beautiful birth and those iconic green and white hoops. So it's, it's quite a, um, an intoxicating mix. What bothers me, though, <laughs> if I'm looking for the cloud again, mm -hmm. <laughs> is, that, is that Celtic, the people who run Celtic now, you know, they, 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 they do trade on the more than just a club slogan. But in recent years, that's just palpably been nonsense. Um, it emerged that they, they refused to pay the living wage, the basic living wage, to their poorest paid employees. Um, and eventually they were forced against their will to agree to it. But when they did so, they, they, um, the board brought all of these employees in um, without any representation, I hasten to add, and I know this for a fact because I know some of them personally, and said, right, okay, we've decided that we will pay you the living wage, but we're going to take away the discretionary bonus that you've been getting for the last 10 years. Um, that's, that's not the, the practice of a, that's not the practice of a, um, a special club or mm. a club like no other. That's a club that's just like every other capitalist enterprise. Um, they, uh, they're currently, um, three of their main sponsors are online betting firms. And I've got a major problem with that because I think online betting firms are predators of the, the people who give Celtic in the main, their support. They, they prey on economically fragile and vulnerable um, people, wherever they can find them. In the poorest areas and the poorest streets in Scotland, these, these uh, online betting companies and, and their brothers and sisters in the, the betting industry, their shops proliferate. Mm. They target mainly working class men at their most fragile moments when they're watching their team on television having a couple of drinks with you know an experience in the euphoria of their team maybe just scoring a goal with a flick of a finger one click they can bet money 10 pound 15 pound 20 pound um you know it's like crack cocaine yeah the betting culture in the uk i think is a lot stronger than it is in australia oh, it's and it's pretty big in australia as well yeah yeah well, i've been reading all about the the Crown Crown Casino <laughs> shenanigans. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. Your first memory of Celtic? January 1969, 5-0 against Hearts. Uh, Who scored? Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> that's John, good well, year. I think Hugh, John Hughes got a couple. John Hughes, Bobby Lennox. But it was just, it was, again, it was just seeing the hoops because... I, I was five or six at the time, and and your your entire childhood, from as far back as you can remember, being a child, you've been told about this this Celtic team. Celtic play a massive part in your family. You get to realise from a, the earliest age that this is something big, sacred in the lives of of your family, including the women, um, who might not go to the games, but they knew about it as well. And then there were the heroes. And, and 
you know, there was, there was your faith, your family, and Celtic. So by the time you were being taken, you know, it would be like a bar mitzvah. It's like a holy communion, mm. your first communion, um, your first trip to Celtic Park, seeing them in the flesh. Um, and, that, and that kind of feeling never leaves you. 23rd of August 1986, Celtic 1, Aberdeen 1 was my very first game. Oh, I see. That's just after we'd won the league at Love Street. Mm. <laughs> and then, and in fact, we were over there for a fair bit. Of that, that, that was the first time I went back to Scotland. No, actually, that, I, I was there when I was really quite young, but I don't remember that. But I was 11 at that time. And um, we led the league quite Until handsomely Christmas. that season. Yeah, and then it just all fell in the heap. We, we wouldn't, wouldn't spend the money. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it was Graham Souness' first season. And that, yeah, exactly. That began, that really began. Yeah. And there was a bit of a false dawn because we won the next season, the centenary season, which I think papered over some cracks. Well, again, this, again, you know, I'm talking about earlier about the incompetence at the top of Scottish society that can quite often strangle good ideas and good people um, and gifts. But, you know, the Celtic board... Um, for much of its existence, was full of very, very incompetent people. And there were a lot of questions over where the money was going, because it certainly wasn't being invested in the team mm. or the stadium. <laughs> um, but they were having the biggest attendances in, in the UK for, for 10, 15 years. And yeah, the current board is far more competent but if you're asking me, do we still adhere to the original values? And I would say no, nah, no. They have done certain, as a counter-argument to that, and I do note the stuff about the living wage, and I completely agree, as a former trade union organiser, I completely agree with you. When I read about that at the time, I was you know, pretty pissed off. Um, but uh, they have, in recent years, tried to beef up the sort of charitable side Actually, of, of the club. you're right. I should say that. The Celtic Foundation, the Celtic Charity Foundation... <clears throat> under the stewardship of the very fine stewardship of Tony Hamilton who I've interviewed for another a podcast oh, Tony's a good man uh, many years ago he's a good man um, so yeah they, they, a lot of work goes into the Celtic Charity Foundation and it does loads of work in fact Tony phoned me just before I came out here about a matter to do with the charitable foundation um, and he's constantly in the lookout for causes that can benefit so yeah I should say that I suppose I would say that there are there's a lot of Tories on that Celtic board <laughs> 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 and you know mm, and there, you know, they, there, there are people on that board and you think mm, what are they there for? When you were at the View at the Celtic View were you there during the old board? Yeah uh, and how close to the campaign to have them flipped out and Fergus coming in were you? Was your oh, no, tenure? No, I'd, I'd gone, but one of my successors, um, Andrew Smith, <clears throat> who's now, a, a, in fact, Andrew is, I think Andrew's still a sports journalist at the Scotsman, <clears throat> but he also stood as a Green, <clears throat> a Green Party candidate Shame. in council elections. <laughs> um, but Andrew was there at that time and, and Andrew uh, was sacked um, by the old board because he unknown to them or well, he, he managed to uh, put out a message in the official club publication criticising <laughs> criticising his own employees and, and, and backing Fergus McCann and of course he managed to get that in uh, before or, or actually Mm. maybe it wasn't that. maybe he'd written something he might have written something for another publication criticising the old board but of course he was reinstated as soon as um, they were ditched and, and Fergus McCann the, the saviour of the modern Celtic came in and a man that I think uh, and look I know I, I, we all remember the sort of the history of Fergus controversial character um, after we stopped the 10, the league um, flag raising ceremony for the next season got booed because of yeah. what happened with um, Vim Janssen and all that kind of stuff. And I remember at the time thinking, this guy's a legend. Oh, of course. Um, a lot of Celtic fans who booed him then 
have had cause to regret it. A, l a lot of, the, again, there was a PR struggle going on. Uh, Fergus McCann had, um, uh, he'd fallen out with one or two of the, his backers or those who had helped get rid of the old board, um, including one or two individuals who felt that they were due a place on the board as of right, simply because they'd campaigned. Whereas Fergus, having committed more than half his personal fortune, with no guarantee he was going to get any of it back, mm. was looking for a certain amount of money up front from these rich backers that they wanted a seat on the board. He simply wanted to see evidence that they were in it yeah. for as much as he was. Um, so these, some of these individuals then used the press, uh, Daily Record, among others, to slaughter Fergus for their own ends, and also because of um, uh, because their ambition had been stunted. And there was a narrative that Fergus was, uh, was you know, should step aside because he didn't know what he was doing, and that Rangers were continuing to win, and, and they should be splashing cash right now on, you know, m massive investment in the playing squad. Whereas Fergus said. Well, look, it wouldn't be ideal if Rangers win 10 in a row. But my main aim here is to ensure that, there, that Celtic still exist. And crucially, that we continue to pay our bills and that we're, a, we're solvent. And we don't go into administration. We don't get liquidated. And so he took all the those who felt that he was holding them back, that as soon as he'd saved them, he should move aside, let other people in, spend big money again that they didn't have and stop Rangers winning 10 in a row. But he did st stop Rangers winning 10 in a row. And the reason why Celtic are, are going through a golden period in their history right now and breaking all sorts of records and the reason why they're far and away the best run and richest club in Scotland and one of the best run and richest in the UK is because of the foundations that he put in. And it's because he resisted going down the path that Rangers, unfortunately, went down um, before 2011, um, when they were simply spending money they didn't have, uh, cheating the tax man and not paying bills. And it, and it led, to, well, led to what happens to lots of other companies who can't pay their bills and and that's that's the legacy of uh, Fergus McCann. Coming back to Fergus in a moment, do you think Rangers should have those titles stripped from them during that period? Oh God. Um, well, there's clear there's clear evidence. Yeah, right. Of wrongdoing. There's also, yeah, there's also a narrative that um, says, well, what what would be achieved if. Uh, <clears throat> It's, but it, there's precedent in so many other different sports. Um, Lance Armstrong lost all of his uh, yep. Tour de France titles. Melbourne Storm, the, Vic, the, the team that plays in the National Rugby League here in, in Australia, cheated the salary cap system. They won a number of national championships, lost those as well. I agree. I, well, I, I, want to, I want to believe that they should be stripped of them. And if they did, I'm not going to be unhappy. I can't lie. But morally, and I've written this, I've got to be consistent about this, and I've thought about it. Again, we, 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 we say that um, in football, the, 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 the relationship we talked about before, about Celtic and their fans and what Celtic means to us, Rangers have the same relationship with their fans. It's, it's, a, it's a working class fan base. They've got, a, there's a cultural and civic aspect to their fanaticism, their love. I mean, it is, they, they love their club as much as we love ours. It stands for things that matter to them. And... And they are the people. Evidently. <laughs> 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 well, I just start singing, follow, follow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so, look, you know, we get our, we get our love of Celtic through um, handed down memories. And I, I, I think that the, well, the current Rangers fans, and I know, you know a few of them are, are friends
friends of mine, they're, they get their support for Rangers and it's um, you know handed down to them. And I and it's almost like those memories, those handed down memories almost act as a bridge over the malfeasance of uh, the officers in charge. It wasn't wasn't the Rangers fans that put them down. Mm. It was low level corruption, greed, um, and and a, la a lack of accountability. Should those fans and, and their ancestors, you know, the memories, you know, of generations going back, be punished when you, you know, as pettily taken away their titles, or saying, well, it's it's not the same club. Of course, it's the same club. They played in blue, they played in red and black socks, white shorts. They play at Ibrooks. <laughs> you know, if Celtic, if Celtic really wanted them to go down, if Celtic wanted them to be stripped of their titles. Um, the Celtic board could have moved. So could UEFA, so could the SFA, and made it happen. So Celtic are the richest, most powerful club in the country at the moment. They've got a seat at the top tables in Europe. They don't want it to happen. Mm. And there's a reason for that. One, whether we like it or not, and I don't like the old firm tagline, but as Peter Lowell said, when Rangers were uh, uh, went out of business and had to start again in the third division, um, we lost several million pounds a season. Mm. And no matter what any Celtic fan says, part of um, the way we define ourselves is through Rangers football. It's what we think of Rangers. And, and, and if people tell you differently, they're, they're lying. Uh, you just look at all the Celtic fan websites and how many pages are taken up by discussing the other lot, their players. I mean, I know as much about the history of Rangers as I do of Celtic, and I know Rangers fans who know as much about the history of Celtic as Rangers, and I think that's true for both clubs. Yeah, and the, the mere fact that you and I are talking about what is predominantly yeah. a Celtic part so of the I'm podcast not, that we're talking I about. Would, I would not be... You know, upset in the slightest, and I would think that it was they got what they bloody well deserved if they get their titles taken away. But then you think, well, do, do their fans deserve that? There were like the, my, my only like sort of comment or, or question you to, to put to you on this one is uh, uh, anecdotal. I mean, I don't live there, so uh, my experience is fundamentally different to um, those who live in Scotland. But so a lot of my cousins sort of mentioned. Um, that they felt that there was a, um, a, a fresh air in, about the place whilst they were playing down in the in the third division. However, I think if you had a couple of beers with them, they'd say, oh, I wouldn't mind when they come back, I'll look forward to those games. So maybe there's an imbalance in, in their theory. But they did say that they thought that, that, that they've not enjoyed that toxicity or, you know, just that the, 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 they would talk about the the nervousness that would have in the week leading up to a Celtic Rangers clash. Yeah, but that, but it's bollocks. It's, it's like, that's just bollocks. I've heard that said in Scotland a lot and some of my own relatives have said it, but without that, without that nervousness, that edge, you know, what, where's the element of competition? Mm. If Rangers aren't, if Rangers weren't here, Celtic will win the title from now until that comet with Earth's name on it hits us. We, everyone knows that. Mm. Well, what's the point in that? Yeah. Well, there's no competition, there's no game. With Rangers, there is a possibility of competition. And that edge that, that you, you experience, and yet can be toxic, uh, a week or so before an old firm game, a Celtic Rangers game, is, is that's competition. That's what happens in Milan. It happens mm. in Buenos Aires. It happens in Madrid, Barcelona, London, Manchester, Liverpool, and and the rivalry is better for it, and the the quality and the the competitiveness is better for it. 
Celtics competition uh, and place in Europe. I'm interested in your thoughts on that. I am incre- incredibly frustrated as each season goes by the gulf that exists between essentially the top yeah. teams in England, uh, Spain, Italy, Germany and France uh, with the rest. And the notion of a European Champions League is a complete farce now. The old European Cup is well and well, truly dead. Just, I mean, again, do you want to talk about a political analogy? Is there anything more purely capitalistic and corporate as the European Champions League? Yeah. There, there is nothing more un- unequal, and, and it's the last bastion of untrammeled, pure, corporate, um, untethered capitalism, which basically says the richest and the biggest will get richer and bigger and those who are not will, get, will become poorer and less able. And any element of fairness, no. Any, anything that might detract or might diminish the riches, the income streams of the big clubs in those five leagues isn't allowed. And, and everyone saw it coming. Um, and, the, and nobody was able to do anything about it. They could, they could still do something about it. You know, you've got, you get club. I mean, look at Ajax. Ajax got to the semi-finals of the European Champions League last season, uh, outplayed Spurs over the two legs. How Spurs got into that final was, mm-hmm. um, how Spurs even got anywhere near the semi-final um, was just a joke. Uh, and yet Ajax are going to have to play a qualifier. Um, Celtic are going to have to play four. In recent recent seasons, the likes of Benfica won the European Cup twice, been in the final five times. Yeah. And the left, big city club, big club, big city at the centre of Europe have to pre-qualify. Um, From a country where their national team is, yeah. you know, by all reports, one yeah. of the best teams in the world. Yeah. Porto, another team that actually did break Porto. the system and actually win it in 2004, um, uh, you know, treated as second-class yeah. citizens. Yeah, and then, you know, the Turkish teams, Greek teams, um, all, all clubs who who contributed to the golden age of European competition in the 60s, 70s and 80s, when there was uncertainty, which is the, the element, the true element of uh, competition. Mm. Um <clears throat> And and where there was where, where gifts were evenly distributed, but now because of the these four, France arguable. I mean, France is a joke in itself. I mean, only one French club has ever won a European Cup. That yeah. was Marseille, and it was a big question mark over corruption with that one. Only two other clubs have won a, any kind of European trophy. I mean, France are one of the most underachieving. Um, Incompetent football nations on earth. I mean, Paris Saint Germain have won. They won a European Cup Winners Cup in 1996, and that's been it. Mm. Nowhere near anything. Yeah, I was too polite by chucking them in that group. I should have left them out of it. Yeah, Marseille. I think Saint Etienne made. Saint Etienne got a final. Yeah. Um, Marseille won the European Cup once. Runners up once. Lyon haven't even been in a European Cup final. Bordeaux haven't been in a European Cup final. You know, this is a this is a football nation that hardly deserves Scotland. Mm. Scotland has got more European winners than France, Belgium, Holland, Portugal. But they are there at the top five because of the television money. Um, is there a way back from this, or is this just going to become a... Industrial self- action. Yeah. <laughs> Industrial action well, solves it, everything. Well, it kind of created it in the first place. Because the Italian teams are cracked to shits in the first place. It said, we're not happy about the fact that it's only Juventus or AC Milan that's getting to play in the European Cup each year, and so we're putting pressure well, on your wafer to change it up. Well, basically, if you, you could have a... I mean, with social media and crowdfunding and, and instant crowds, you know, you, you can... You can organise anything at three hours' notice these mm. days. Um, so I would have thought that people at Peter Lawwell, who who's like one of the most shrewd 
football strategists in the game. And he's been making, you know, he's been making lots of alliances with with these clubs like Ajax. I mean, the I, the um, Ajax president uh, Van der Sar used to be the Manchester United goalkeeper. He was lamenting the fact that a club with Celtic's history and Ajax's history don't automatically qualify. Well, what what he said was that if you win the league and you have previously won European Cup, you should get in straight away. Not he's not he's not arguing for a free pass for anybody who's ever won the league or else Nottingham Forest and Aston Villa would be in there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so uh, um, I would have thought that if they were really serious about altering this and nothing, nothing makes the elites tremble more than industrial action and industrial action would be they get together the local federations and they decide they're going to suspend professional football for uh, you know a wild cat strikes every so often um, until they listen or else or else they simply say we're not participating. Now of course there are cost implications, there are income implications but if they don't do something they're just they're, they're going to be permanently excluded. Mm. So they're like so Celtic are having to negotiate four qualifying rounds. Soon they'll be told now you're not even going to get in. We've, we've created another competition for you and there'll be no bridge mm. to get in, no pyramid. Which has been discussed now. So Celtic, you know, Celtic and Ajax and Anderlecht and Benfica and Porto and Galatasaray, AEK, Athens, I want to accept that, then, then fine, but they're, they're doing that down their fans. But if they had come up with a strategy, and you can't tell me that they can't have a, some kind of strategy where they withdraw their labour one way or another. Um, which might be non-participation for a, a year or so in European football. There's a slight precedent for that in 19, and Celtic benefited from it in 1968-69, where Celtic were Celtic were drawn against Fern Schwarz, the Hungarian champions in the 68-69 European Cup. Um, and then the Russian, the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia happened. And Celtic said, took a principled stand and said, we are not going to uh, play against a Soviet bloc entity. And other clubs followed suit. And uh, they had to redraw the first round. Hmm. And the Soviet, uh, the Soviets took all the, or, um, tried to force all the Eastern European teams to come out of the, the draw in 68-69. So Celtic ended up playing St Etienne instead. Right. So that happened within days at a time when there was no such thing as mass communication and it was on a point of principle. And we're getting to the stage where um, all these big famous clubs with far more um, of a football hinterland than the likes of Paris Saint-Germain or mm. Chelsea or Manchester City um, are, are concerned. You know, these are, again, these are just boutique clubs. Mm. Um, and let, you know, un unless they, they're happy to be permanently locked out from there, then they're going to have to take guerrilla action. And uh, as you and I know, nothing upsets the rich yeah. than, than, um, than a nice wee strike properly organised. That could be something I could do at Dunn Street, my, <laughs> my business. The last couple of questions, because I know you've got uh, things to do today. Um, the uh, Brendan Rodgers saga from last year and mm. the reappointment of Neil Lennon, what are your thoughts? Love thoughts Neil on Lennon, that? delighted. Was never a great fan of Brendan Rodgers to begin with. Um, if he was chocolate, he would eat himself. Um, <laughs> those, those teeth kind of... He, he just... It just resonated fakery from top to bottom. Yeah, we started playing decent football and we won a couple of trebles and you don't sniff at them. Mm. You got a lot of money to do it and um, you got a 
hell of a lot of money to do because the, the Celtic board of Dermot Desmond was was thoroughly pissed off, um, allegedly because of the way Rangers celebrated by beating Celtic in penalties in mm. the 2016 Scottish Cup semi-final. But Rogers was always just going to see Celtic as a stepping stone. But all this badge kissing, um, I loved Celtic. It's always been my club. And then he's off like a thief in the night. There's nothing, nothing that would have prevented Brendan Rodgers seeing out the rest of the season. Three more, three more months. Right, yeah. Now his justification was that Leicester City, Leicester City, what are Leicester City? We're holding his feet to the fire, saying, "No, you have to come now." Well, he's Brendan Rodgers. You know, we're not talking about Manchester United or um, Liverpool or Barcelona here. We're talking about. What about Leicester City? And I think they came out and uh, refuted that statement anyway and said that we didn't put any pressure yeah. on Brendan Rodgers or his agent to sign before the close of the season. They, they just said to him, yeah, well, I'm happy to come to you, but we're on the verge of making history here. This means a lot to these fans who have invested a lot of time, effort, emotion, money in this. Can you give me three months? I mean, most people's, most normal people's employment they have to give three months' notice anyway. Yeah. But he left overnight, didn't even say farewell to the players or the staff that he worked with at Lennox Town. And, and that was Rangers. Rangers had done him um, the best chance Rangers will ever get in stopping Celtic winning 10 in a row was last season in February when, when he went and Neil Lennon came back and and although Lennon would have wanted to change the style of play, he couldn't. He couldn't afford to start Do changing the style at that stage in the season. And that's when Rangers had an opportunity to stop this, and Brendan Rodgers gave them that opportunity. Last couple of questions. Uh, the um, Scott Brown. Where does he fit in the pantheon of Celtic captains? Uh, he's 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 there. We've only had 30 captains. I went back and checked. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he... he yeah, OK. Um, in terms of trophies, one, he's up there. Um, Tenure as well. He's been there. Yeah, yeah, he has. Um, I, I'm so, the wrong person to ask about Scott Brown. I've never been... He's, he's played his best football for the last two years, actually. But before then, um, I quite often thought he was in the team simply because it cost us four million quid. Mm. And he's got a big personality and a big dressing room personality. And I think he's able to, you know, probably able to intimidate or get his way even with incoming managers and coaches, coaching staff. And I think some, sometimes the way he conducts himself on the park um, is not becoming of a Celtic captain. Um, you know, it's easy to it's easy to take the piss out of Rangers when you're when you're on top of them and beating them three, four, five nil, or you know when you know they're going what they're going through. Um, I I just wouldn't. You know, I wouldn't. I wouldn't really be expecting a Celtic captain to be laughing in the face of um, opponents as they're getting sent off. Um, you know, going up eyeball to eyeball with opponents after they've scored a goal. Do you need to? Mm -hmm. McNeil wouldn't have done it. Paul McStay wouldn't do it. Kenny Dalglish wouldn't have done it. Jock Steen wouldn't have done it. Alan Stubbs, Roy Aiken. They, you know, these were all hard, big, competitive Celtic men. They, you know, you don't go rip about your business. And I, if, if you just lose that, and it's too late now, fine. But great Celtic captain and the trophies um, he's he's that, that we've won under his captaincy, his fitness levels, um, his sheer uh, personality, his will to win, Personal conduct, which which is the big thing about being captain, on field conduct. I mean, because off field, there's you can't criticise him. He's you know he's 
but he leads an exemplary life mm. away from the park. Of that, there is no doubt. And he does good things away from the park. Um, I, 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 do, I cringe when I see him baiting or making fun of opposition players. Being an Australian and uh, uh, following the Australian cricket team, certainly in the 1990s and 2000s, the Australian cricket team had a psychological edge over opposing sides. They backed it up with talent. Yeah, yeah. But they got in the heads of their opponents. And I liked that. I don't like the current Australian cricket team, and a lot of Australians will agree with me on that. They think they're a bunch of dickheads. But that 80s, sorry, the 90s and 2000s team were uh, a cut above the rest, and I think that they were winning games before they even walked on the pitch. Yeah, and I saw a bit of Scott Brown in that in those tough games against I Rangers. I don't think that. But you see, you're talking you're talking about people at Ricky Ponting, um, or uh, well, Steve was the one. I'm well, him, and then you've got you know Lillian Thompson of an earlier generation. I mean, they, they were supremely gifted um, sportsmen. You know, they, they were amongst the best cricketers that have ever been. So they could back it up with pure talent. Yeah. But also a cricket match lasts, you know, one game lasts like a, an entire, the best part of a week. You know, you're out there from what, 10 o'clock in the morning till six o'clock at night. And so psychological warfare is built in to the fabric of cricket. You know... You don't think in football it is? Nah, that, I don't think so. I think, like, it's over quickly. You've got too much to concentrate on. Yeah, of course, there's there's a sign... There, there's always going to be a bit of that. I mean, it's a loud game, remember. You know, there's there's mm. lots of fans, so nothing is picked up. Um, or or mo most of what is said is probably... You can't hear it anyway. But it's no, no. I, I, I mean, even if you're even talking about war and 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 um, border pointing, Smith, Smith's never ever going to say anything again. Anyway, after yeah. what happened to him last year, yeah. he's going to be an angel on the park. You know, sledging, he will not do. Mm. Even if I mean, I like a bit. You know, there's the the old. The old stories about sledging and cricket are great, like Merv Hughes um, saying things that you probably couldn't repeat on a <laughs> podcast <laughs> like this. Um, great fun. Yeah. But you always got the impression that there was respect. Even even amidst the sledging, there was respect. I mean, I mean, you, you, during the, the 2005 Ashes series, um, uh, you had... Uh, England players going for pints with Australians. Now, okay, you would if you're an Australian cricket fan, you say, well, that's that's we we're not hard enough. Mm. Well, they were going to lose eventually, yeah, weren't they? Yeah, Australia. So I think it's different. I do think it's different. I think there was still even even despite all the the sledging, there was still respect, and I think sometimes that Brown's conduct as captain on the field on occasions is something less than respectful of opponents. Um, last question. This is going to be a tough one. N name, I was going to say name your top five, but if that's too many, then it's okay. You can shorten that list. But your favourite players that weren't Lisbon Lions that you've seen? Uh, <coughs> Doug Leash. Kenny Doug Leash. George Connolly. Charlie Nicholas. I've just always had a soft spot for Charlie. Um... Henrik Larsson, Lugo, Moravchuk. And that's me just thinking off the top of my head. Yeah, that's a pretty good list. Uh, next week it might, I might think of others, but yeah, those five. Uh, the, um, we spoke off air beforehand about Kieran Tierney being sold. A record transfer fee for, um, for Celtic to another club, $25 million. Um, and... Twitter, for those who were born from 1988 onwards, is in meltdown right now. Uh, for those seasoned Celtic supporters of our age, seen it all before. Jerry Seinfeld once said, we're basically cheering for laundry. Yeah. 25 million. A lot of money. I would be happier if I was more... Uh, if I had confidence that the Celtic board will, will give... Neil Lennon, the bulk of that money, um, to 
spend over the next couple of seasons. I, d I don't expect him to splurge at all in the, in the transfer market in the, the last three weeks. But we're crying out for a left back, mm. a proper left back. And I don't know how we spent three million pounds on Bolly. Um, I know I know it's early days, but three, he is not a three million pound player. Kieran Tierney, no, I'm not happy with Kieran Tierney. Um, he's, you know, Celtic invested a lot of money in him from the age of eight. And yeah, of course, they've got 25 million back. But, you know, Kieran Tierney gave you the impression that he was like the, 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 the Green Brigade's representative on the field. He said as much. Mm. And, and behaved as much. Yeah, and at the end of games, he would grab a loud tailor and and uh, you know and join in with the green brigade, clutching his jersey. Um, and he left at the first opportunity. That's people should realise that you know it's not it's not that he had been the subject of um, lots of transfer rumours over many years and decided to go at twenty six, twenty seven. And that happened to Kenny Dalglish. Dalglish left Celtic at 26 or 27. People compare it with Charlie Nicholas, but Charlie Nicholas was... Celtic were so desperate for the cash. Charlie Nicholas was basically told, was almost like packed into a car blindfolded and taken to a Glasgow City Centre location where he was then told, sign here, you're an Arsenal player. Mm. Um, but Ke Kieran Tierney could have stayed two or three more years, um, being part of a potential 10 in a row, still only be 24. Um, so, yeah, forgive me if I'm not, if, I'm, if I don't wish him all the best. Mm. Uh, I'd, I'd be looking at his agent situation. Um, I understand that he changed agents in the last year or so. Um, yeah, all the, 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 the chest beating. First, first opportunity he had, he was off. On that note, uh, it's been great having you on the, on the podcast today. Um, and from a personal standpoint, you know, uh, for many Celtic supporters that uh, live outside of Britain and Europe for that matter, um, our, our window into the football team that we love is through forms of media communication. Um, and, um, you know, it doesn't matter where you live in the world, after a, a, an important game or, um, or a, a trophy win, you want to read the papers the next day mm, and consume mm. that. And uh, that's in, you know, in the 1980s, it, all we had was the papers that were, they got sent over and then sort of the advent of the internet when all of a sudden this opened up this world where we could read um, excellent writers like yourself and, um, you know, you. Graeme Spears. Graeme Spears is an old... Glenn Friend Gibbons is another guy that I enjoyed reading. Glenn, this. Glenn died sadly. I, I didn't know that. A few that. years ago. No, that's tragic. Um, and yeah, Glenn was a fantastic writer. And it just made uh, the experience all the more enjoyable to read good quality journals and about yeah. the football team and, and broadly a sport that you loved. Hugh so. McDonald is another really good writer. Yeah, absolutely. Although he's he's gone to the he's left the Daily Mail. Sorry, the the Herald and gone to the Daily Mail. And the other ones are. Alan Patillo and the Scotsman. I do. Very know. good. I don't read the Scotsman as much as I used to. I've subscribed to the Herald online for, I reckon, about a decade now. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the Herald and the, 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 the Scotsman's got a decent... The Scotsman's unfortunately dying to death because of it's the incompetence of its owners, which is a shame. Um, but some of its uh, sports writing is still good. And Big Alan is a good writer. Well, we thank you very much for taking... Your time no, my today. pleasure. Thank you for asking me. And we wish you uh, the best of luck when you head back. Thank you. And if you're ever back <laughs> in town. Hopefully make it in one piece. Yeah, indeed. It's a long <laughs> flight. I'll be back to see Claire, my daughter. So, yeah. I'd love to have you back on if, if we can discuss whether we get the 10 or not. That's it. <laughs> Cheers. Right. All the best.